So Docker is an absolutely fantastic application when you need to spin up individual instances of something, individual containers. But what about when you need to stand up multiple containers in a more holistic way quickly and easily and get them to talk to each other without much fuss? Well, if you stick around, I'm going to give you a solution. Well, hello wherever you are, whenever you are. Where am I? I'm in Melbourne, Australia, and when is it? It's September 2019. Now, today we're going to be covering something called Docker Compose. I've had a number of requests to do a video on this, so um, hopefully it will be something that you'll find uh, useful and informative. Um, so what is Docker Compose? Well, as I alluded to in the introduction, it's something that allows you to, I guess, orchestrate or compose um, multiple Docker in instances or multiple Docker containers, should I say, in a more holistic way. So rather than having to enter multiple command line prompts multiple times, you can do it uh, in a more um, synchronized, uh, easier fashion. So um, I don't think we should waste any more time. Let's get on with it. So yes, you are in the right place. This is a video on how to use Docker Compose with a .NET Core API and SQL Server. So just quickly, what you'll need to follow along if you want to do that, uh, you'll need a text editor, I'm using VS Code. You'll need either Docker Desktop or Community Edition, depending on whether you're running Windows, Linux, or Mac. Uh, you'll need the .NET Core SDK installed. I'm using 2.2. Yes, I am aware that 3.0 is on the cusp of being released, but to be honest with you, I've taken a deliberate decision to let that um, version bed in a little bit more before I decide to use it in my videos. So for now, I'm still using 2.2. So you should, you should, if you're using 3 yourself, then you should still be able to follow along and about 40 minutes of your time. Uh, I don't usually specify prerequisites for my videos. I do cover everything in this video absolutely step by step, but just for some of the non-core subjects, I do not detail, go into as much detail as I would usually like, and I just move through them relatively quickly. If you want some more detailed overviews of some of the concepts that come up in this video, then I would suggest the following videos. The first one is the one I did on the .NET Core uh, REST API. Um, we're going to cover that quite a bit in this video, but I'm going to again move through it quite quickly. If you want a detailed discussion, watch that video. The next one is on how to deploy a .NET Core API with Docker. That's mainly around how you construct a Docker file, so you can package up a .NET application into a Docker image. Don't really cover that in this video. We, we need to, to build upon that work, so if you want to you know, get a more detailed conversation on that, then watch that video. And then the last one is how to connect to SQL Server running in Docker. That one possibly you don't even need to watch. Um, I cover most of the same content in this video. So I think with that, I think we've covered all the necessary introduction stuff. So I think you need to get going and start using Docker Compose. Okay, so before we actually start using Docker Compose, I want to basically build up our development environment and get it to a stage where we're ready to use Docker Compose and we understand why we're using Docker Compose. Now, as a, as a basis for our environment, I'm going to take the API example I created in the last doc, well, the second last Docker video, which was about taking a Docker API, okay, taking a .NET Core API and running it in a Docker container. Now that API was effectively really just the standard web API template out of .NET Core. Uh, we didn't really add anything to it from memory at all, uh, apart from the Docker file. So I'm just gonna, I've put that up on my GitHub repository, I'm gonna pull that down, and we're gonna start from there, rather than doing all those steps from scratch. Um, and then I'm gonna build upon that in order to allow it to connect to a database. And then at that point, we're gonna start introducing Docker uh, Compose a bit more. So let's go over to my uh, GitHub site. So it's just github.com forward slash binary thistle. And then I've clicked on the repositories tab. The API I'm talking about is this color API. 
I've just called it that because we're just going to store colors in a database, <laughs> one table with one, well, two columns, an ID column and a column of colors, just really simple, but we're going to use a database. So uh, click on the color API, go to clone or download, and you'll get the URL here and just copy that to your clipboard. So then I'm going to go into a command prompt and I'm going to get to my working uh, directory. I'm just going to take my watch off so it doesn't clunk on the desk uh, and I'm going to change into my OneDrive, I'm going to change into Docs, I'm going to change into my VS Code folder uh, and that's my working folder and then all I do is git clone and we'll just paste in the, the URL of the color API and hit carriage return. And that will go away and it should bring it down and put it in a folder called Color API. So apologies to my American viewers, but I am spelling color the correct way with a U. Uh, it will probably really annoy you. Um, so we'll just change into that folder. Color API. There we go. And we do a listing. We'll have that project there. So we can then open that in uh, VS Code. I think you just type code. Uh, I think it's uh, open it in a window, there we go, and we have it loaded. Now it'll probably pop up with some prompts to rebuild, there we go. So there are some unresolved dependencies, yes, and required assets to build and debug are missing from Color API, click yes, and that will go off and get them. Now, we'll probably get a few warnings, but I think they've been resolved, that all looks great. So I'm not going to go through this in any detail. It is literally the bog standard web API template. It doesn't come with any database connectivity code or anything like that. But what it does come with is a Docker file. Again, watch my previous uh, video on Docker if you want to get step-by-step -step detail of how that works. At a high-level summary, basically this Docker file is going to take the project we've got here and package it into a Docker image that we can run later. So just before we go any further, I, I do want to check that the, the code is working and it's still running okay. Um, so forget Docker, forget anything like that. I'm just gonna do a dot net run, just to run it and make sure it's, it's working as we expect. Looks okay. Let me just check it in, in a browser. So we'll just do HTTP localhost port 5000 um, API values. Cool, so that's working. So basically all it's doing um, is hitting our controller, uh, values controller, and hitting this action here and pulling back to values. So that's all cool. That's it just working and running locally on our machine. Great, so the next thing I want to do is to make sure that the Docker file component of it, if you actually, yeah, go back here, if you look in, look in that, um, want to make sure that that is building our image uh, appropriately. Now what I'm going to do is I'm just going to move over to our Docker. Um, I'd, I'd really advise you install this plugin if you're using VS Code and it gives us a list of all the images we've got on our system and containers. I've cleared my system down so there's nothing there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to build this API as an image. So Docker build, and I'm gonna tag it, give it a name, and that is my username on Docker Hub, and then we'll call it color API. You've got to put all this in lowercase. If you actually capitalize any of it, I believe you get an error, and then our working directory is just the directory we're in, where all our, um, well, where our Docker file exists. And that will go off now and it will run through that Docker file that you can see on screen and it will basically uh, build up our image based on the steps in the Docker file. Uh, and once that's finished downloading, it will then run and we'll, we'll have a look and see and make sure that that works. And we can then move on to adding some new database code into this API that allows us to connect into a SQL Server. Cool, so that's finished. And one of the things you can see here is actually created a number of images for us. You can see it's brought down the Microsoft Core SDK image, which is up here. It's brought down the runtime image, which is being used here. And then finally, it's created our API image. So all that's left to do is actually run our image as an active container. And so in order to do that, we just type Docker run, 
and we're going to specify an uh, internal external port mapping. So we're going to map externally to port 8080 and we're going to map that internally to the port 80 that we're exposing in, in our container. And then we just specify the tag name, which is binary thistle, this TLE, uh, color API, color, color API. And that looks like that's running. So again, you can see here in our uh, plugin extension that this is running and it's running on port 80 internally. So if you go back to where we tested it here, the port that we need to uh, call is 8080. That's our external port mapping in internally to the port 80. And it should give us exactly the same result. And in fact, it does. So that's cool. So we've gone to GitHub, we've done a git clone to pull the source code down. I suggest you do that unless you want to do it from scratch. Um, we've checked that the, the code actually ran locally and natively on our desktop and then we've created an image using the, the existing Docker file that's in there, which was cool. And then we've just uh, run that image as a container. So we now have our API running as a container, um, but we're going to stop that now and we're going to make some code changes to enable it to access a database. Right, so let's jump over to our uh, code again. We'll stop our container. API container, just uh, right click and stop in there and move back to our code. Now, the first thing I want to do is add a folder for our model. We're going to add a model into our solution just to store a list of colors. It's a fairly simple uh, setup. So we'll call it color.cs. For my American friends out there, if you want to call it color without the U, you're more than welcome to do that. Um, so this is our very simple model class. So we'll just do our namespace and it's uh, color API models. And then our class itself, public class color. Don't know if you can hear that, there were some birds chirping outside. Summer, summer's on its way here in, uh, in Melbourne, it's very nice. Um, do public int uh, id as our first uh, attribute and our first property and we'll set get set. And then public string, what we call it, color. And uh, we'll, we'll allow that, and that's the thing. I don't think it will allow that because the class is the same. Uh, okay, we'll say color, color name. There we go. Keep it nice and simple. Birds are going crazy out there. Um, don't know what, I don't know if they're fighting. Okay, so we'll save that, save that, that's cool. Now the next thing we then want to do is add a DB context class into our project. I'm not going to go into massive detail about it in um, my last video, or not last video, one of the videos I did on .NET Core API full development will go into what the uh, DB context is. It's basically a representation of our database using Entity Framework Core. So we'll, we'll add that now. So the first thing just to check is if you just type .NET EF, just to make sure that you have the tools installed. Um, if you get this little unicorn kind of thing popping up, then yeah, that's all good to go. If you don't get that, if you get some kind of error message, again, check out my uh, video or blog article on building a .NET Core API and I tell you how you can resolve that if it's not, if you're not getting that. So again, within our models folder, we're just going to create a new class and we're going to call it colorcontext.cs and the same namespace, color API models. And the class name itself is, oh, it's a public class, color, uh, color context, context. Actually, I'm forgetting something up here. We need a using directive to use a Microsoft Entity Framework Core. Cool. So back to our class, public class, we're gonna call it color context and it's going to inherit from, no surprises, the context. And then we'll just create our class constructor, public color context. 
DB context options, color context options, and then say base. About empty for now. And then we want to add what we call a data set, which is effectively a representation. It's taking our model, our colors model, and it's representing it as a table really in our database. That's all it is. Long way around, DB set. What type of DB set is it? It's color. And I'm just thinking out loud, I might be wrong, but since I'm spelling it the English way or the Australian way with a U, it's not a reserved keyword. I'm wondering if uh, my US friends, if you use color spelt the US way without the U, if you're allowed to do that, it might be a reserved keyword. So you might be, you might have to use the, the English spelling. Um, there you go. Uh, might keep it simple for you. Uh, and then we're good, the DB set is gonna be called color items and set get set on that cool okay very simple but it's still a bit disconnected so we need to do a couple of other things to get this working fully end to end so that it can actually talk to a database right so we've just done our db context uh, we have our model but at the moment the db context which is a representation of our database doesn't really know where to go in terms of that physical database. Now, we, don't, we haven't spun one up yet. We're gonna spin, uh, spin one up in a container in a minute. But that being said, we want to lay the groundwork for where does the DB context go? So in order to do that, uh, we need to provide some kind of connection uh, details, uh, firstly, uh, to enable it to connect. Now, ordinarily, you would put that in your app settings JSON file as a JSON string that would go in there. Um, but because we're going to containerize our API, I'm not going to do that. Um, instead, I'm going to use environment variables to basically build up our connection string. Now, the reason for that will become more obvious later, but in short, it means that you can inject new environment variables into the container application when it starts up. If you stored your uh, connection string in app settings JSON as a file, and you wanted to change some of those settings such as the password that you're using to connect or the database name you would potentially have to rebuild your whole container which you don't want to do so you basically want to have a kind of almost static <clears throat> don't like using that term static container that you can inject different environment variables into at, at runtime so that's the approach we're going to take so in order to do that we're going to jump over to our startup class and we're going to go into our configure services method and we're going to start setting up the environment variables that we are going to construct our connection string from. So we're going to provide four things. We're going to provide a, ser a server name. We're going to provide a, a user ID that we want. We're going to provide a port that we want and we're going to provide a password that we want. So let's begin. So let's do var server equals configuration. And this is where we put in the name of our environment variable and we'll call it something like db server and if we don't have an environment variable then we'll just pass in a default value so we're going to pass in local host the next one we want is the port exactly the same pattern if we have an environment variable it will use that and we'll call it the db port we don't have one, then we'll just pass in a default port of 1443, which is the default SQL Server port. Uh, user ID, or user. Now, just a word of warning here, I'm going to use, let's see, db user. I'm going to do a very bad thing here. Red, red um, flashing lights, do not do this in production. Do not ever do this. I'm just doing this to save a bit of time, but I'm going to use the SA account which is the system administrator account for SQL Server. Do not do this in production or even in test, really. Um, you should create another user. I'm just doing this for quickness. Um, and then password.
um, well, again, you shouldn't ever, 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 ever store your um, store your passwords uh, in plain text in code, especially if you push up to GitHub, it's all published. Um, and there's, again, there are ways you can get around all of this and you can store it locally. I just don't have time to do that. I have done other videos that take you through how that works, specifically the one deploying um, an API to Azure, De with De Azure DevOps. That explains how to not do this. I'm just doing this for quickness. Now I'm putting a password in here. I'm putting a user ID that don't really exist yet, so we will do that in a minute. It will all make sense eventually. So basically what we're saying is if we have an environment variable called DB server, then we'll use it. Otherwise, we'll revert it to local host. Same for all of these attributes. Now what we want to do is actually build up our, um, add our DB context as a service to our application and um, make sure that uh, it uses those connection string attributes to connect to the database we're going to spin up. Now, you need to make sure um, that you add these two additional uh, using statements, so you need to add a reference to your models uh, here, and you also need to make reference to Entity Framework Core, so make sure you add those in at the top there, which I just did earlier. Um, I'm just making sure that you've done that as well. So you then just type services, add db context, what db context? Well, we want to add color context, with some options. And those options are, you want to use SQL Server. And then really all you want to do in here is pass in your connection string. So if you're using uh, your connection string from AppSettings.json, you would re reference that. We're actually going to build up our connection string using these parameters here. So if anything's going to go wrong, if any typing mistake's going to happen, it's going to be here. So I might have to circle back if I make a mistake, but let's see if we can uh, do it without any mistakes. So first thing is server, and we are just making that equal to our server variable. And then we're putting in a comma, and we're going to reference our port, semicolon. So that's our server component, server name port, semicolon, and then in it, initial catalog. Make sure I've spelled initial correct, because I always get that wrong. This is just going to be the name of our database. Now we could put that up here as well. Um, I've not done that. Uh, I guess we could. In fact, let's do that. Let's do var uh, database equals, may as well keep it consistent, configuration. Uh, oh, what the hell's going on there? Configuration, uh, we'll call it uh, database. Otherwise, we'll just call it something like colors. Okay, so initial catalog, curly brackets, uh, database. Oh. I'm going to pass in our user ID, and that will be equal to user, and then finally our password which will be equal to, no surprises, password. Cool, so that's basically us told our, uh, we're adding our DB context to our services pool, and then we are using SQL Server as the database type, and we're passing in our connection string there. So hopefully that is correct. Okay, so what we need to do now, um, because we're using Entity Framework, Entity Framework works in a number of ways. Two main ways are code first and database first. So with database first, you create your database first and you basically import the schema effectively into your code application, your code project, and it will, Entity Framework core will create classes and things of that nature and references to your database as you've designed it that way. We're not doing it that way, we're doing a code first approach. So we've created our colors model and our DB context, and we're gonna use this migration strategy to migrate those things into our database that way. So the first thing we need to do is create a migrations file that we will then use to create the collateral in our database when we finally spin that up. So it's pretty simple to do that. 
all you need to do is just type .NET and make sure you're in your, obviously in your project directory, .NET EF, into framework, migrations, add, and then you just give the migration a name. Now, usually the name you give it, it makes some kind of reference to the new additions that you've added. So we've, we're adding our color model, so we'll call it add color model. Hit enter, and if you keep an eye on the folder structure here, you'll see we have a migrations folder with a number of files in it, and that those files basically just tell um, our database how to create the tables that match our code classes. Pretty cool. Now, ordinarily, what you would do now, or what you can do, is you would then, uh, at the command line, execute that migration file. So all we've done is generated the migration file. We would then actually run the migration file against our database. Now, our database doesn't exist yet because we're going to use a SQL Server container. So it's a bit awkward. So this is where we start to explore the concepts with, um, with Docker Compose. So just parking that for a minute, instead of running our mi migrations manually, we're going to build it into our code. So when our application starts up, it will check to see if the migrations have been run. And if not, it will then run them against the database. Now, I'm not suggesting that you do this in a production environment. You wouldn't really want your application uh, in production every time it started up checking to see if the migrations had been run and then run it against a production database. You wouldn't want to take that strategy there. But again, for the purposes of just uh, getting to Docker Compose and talking about Docker Compose, that's what I'm going to do. So we'll do that now. Okay, so in our models folder, we're going to create our new class. Uh, hell if I selected the models folder. Now we'll call it prepdb.cs. Don't forget the CS extension. Uh, I'm going to have a few using statements. Microsoft uh, ASP.NET Core Builder using Microsoft Entity Framework Core using Microsoft extensions pens injection <coughs> excuse me I'm thinking I'm losing my voice uh, using system link set up our namespace color API models there we go not migrations so it must be painful to watch models there we go <coughs> and then we will set up our static class. So it's a public static class. And we'll call it, of course, prep db. And again, this is just going to um, look at that. <laughs> this is just going to um, set up our database and might call our migrations file and migrate across our stuff if it's not already there. And we're also, why not, we're going to put a bit of data into our database as well. So, um, uh, yeah, that's uh, why this class exists. So before we do anything, we're going to do uh, expose our first uh, method, public static void method. And we'll call it uh, mm, prep population. And we'll pass in an I application builder, call it app. And basically the point of this is we're actually going to get what's called um, a, a scope. We're going to get the scope of our DB context. So our DB context is running. This is basically just getting almost like a, a hook in to that DB context so we can use it to actually uh, run the migration. That's all we're doing. So using, we're going to create a variable inside our using statement. Uh, we'll call it service scope. And we'll reference our app builder object, look at our application services of which our DB context will one and uh, is one, and we'll get the we'll call the create scope. So then with that, we're then going to do something with that service scope. Before we do that though, I'm going to create another method. If I create it in the right place, that would be useful. So we're going, to, we're going to do something in here. We're just not going to do it yet. I'm going to create another method and I'm going to call it public static void uh, seed data. And into that, we're going to pass our DB context, which we'll do in a second. So our um, 
context is color context. Call it context. So we're going to pass that into this method. So that's what we're going to do in here. So we're going to call seed data. We're going to reference our service scope that we've just defined above. Service provider, get service. Make sure you pick the right one, not services. And then we're going to supply what type of service do we want to get? We want to get our color context. So that should get as a reference to our or DB context class that we're passing into the seed data, data method will then do the magic that needs to happen. So let's just do a system uh, console uh, write line just so we can keep track of what's happening. Uh, I will say applying migrations, standby, and then we'll do context here obviously database migrate and so what that does is it takes this uh, well it takes our latest migration file and it applies it to the database and we will have our database schema in place okay so we could leave it at that but I'm going to actually add some data into the database as well now so creating the schema is one thing that's useful but um, probably a bit more useful to have some data in there rather than having to add it manually. So the first thing I'm going to do is check to see if we do already have data in the database. If we do, then we just leave it. If we don't, then we'll add some in. So context, color items, any. So if we don't have any items in the database, then we'll add them. Otherwise, we'll just write something out to the console system console right line mm. already have data not seeding otherwise we'll add some data in so we'll do another system right line I'll just copy this actually rather than typing it out again and uh, we'll just uh, data Seeding. just so we can see that it's working when we test the application so in order to do that we'll make use of our context again context and this time uh, again we'll make use of our um, colors color items collection and we're going to do something called add range not ass range add range and then we simply add a couple of uh, colors to our database. It's not terribly uh, complicated. Let me just put a semicolon there uh, to stop it erroring out. So we just do new color and then we'll just give it a uh, color name equals red. And it's uh, basically that simple. We'll add, it, we'll add a few in. Um, I'm just going to copy this actually. Do orange, yellow, green, blue. I think that's enough. Yellow, green, and blue. Cool, so if you don't have any color items in our uh, database, then we'll add them. If not, we'll just write the message out. So all we need to do now is make sure that we call this uh, method from our startup class, otherwise um, nothing will happen. So if we pop over to our startup class, we'll just add it in to our configure method after use MVC. And as it's a static class, it's quite straightforward. Prep DB, um, prep population, and then we pass over our app at builder context here. And that will just go in and it should work. So we've got one last thing to do. We need to update our controller to actually make use of the DB context and pull data back. And then we're ready to start testing it against our SQL Server instance running in Docker. So let's just go over to our values controller. And again, this was the standard controller that we just had out of the 
web API template. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna update this method action here to actually make use of a database. Now what I'm also gonna do, just for clarity, I'm just gonna get rid of these um, because we're not really gonna make use of them. So the first thing we need to do is add a using directive up here to make sure that we have access to our models folder. Our models namespace, should I say, not folder. And then within our controller class, we're going to create a private instance of a context object that we'll make use of later. So private read only, color context, and color context with an underscore, which is a standard convention. Now we're gonna create, a, we're gonna use dependency injection to inject in our actual colors controller. Uh, I'm gonna use constructor dependency injection. So we'll need to create a constructor in our controller. So public values controller. I'm gonna pass in a color context called context. Note there's no underscore. And then all we simply do is set our private color context to the context that's injected in via dependency injection. And again, I'm not gonna cover dependency injection here, that's for another time and place. And that basically means we just have access to use our context object throughout the rest of our code. And then the rest is relatively easy. I'm gonna comment this out so you can just see um, the differences, and there's not really that many, it's fairly similar. So again, we'll do HTTP get public action result I enumerable, and we're going to enumerate round color, and then we'll just give it a name get color items. It's not correctly. And then it's really quite simple. We just return from our context our color items. That's it, really. So we use our DB context. Hopefully it should be connected correctly to our database. And then instead of returning a static string as we were previously doing, we're just uh, returning, yeah, the color items that we have in our database. So that is all the database code correct. So now all we have to do is spin up an instance of SQL Server and connect into it uh, from our API. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna spin up a SQL Server instance in Docker and we're gonna then connect into it from our API running natively on our local desktop. So we're not gonna put our API in Docker just yet. We're just gonna run it locally and we're gonna connect into our SQL instance running in Docker and it should work. Um, and then we'll take, take it from there. Okay, so just before we uh, spin up our SQL Server instance, I just want to draw your attention back to our startup class and the fact that we we're trying to set up some environment variables, which basically build our connection string. And I'm gonna use those same default values when I spin up SQL Server so that, well, so that we can connect. Now, one thing I'm just noticing here, it's not really an error, but it's just, I wanted to use port 1433, which is the default SQL Server port. Um, you can use any port you like, but I just wanted that to be 1433. So I'm gonna change that to 1433. Now, I also did a video on spinning up a SQL Server instance in Docker. That was the last video I did. I'll put a link to it somewhere. Um, and you can take a look at that. I'm not gonna go into too much detail here about what everything does, but it's fairly self-explanatory. So let's, it's basically just issuing a docker run command. So docker run, and then we're gonna pass in some environment flags. So the first one is accept EULA equals yes. So that's just, oh, that's just accepting the licensing agreement. The next environment flag we're gonna pass in is the SA password. And I'm just gonna set that equal to this. And 
And then the final environment variable I'm going to set is the version of SQL Server that we want. So MSSQL underscore PID equals Express. And we're then going to do our port mapping. That's why I wanted to change this, just to make sure we're mapping the port correctly. So we're going to map externally uh, external port to our internal port. So 1433 to 1433. Now you can, uh, you know, you can configure that as you please, but I've just kept it same both internally and externally at, as 1433. So make sure that's correct. I think I'm slightly numerically dyslexic because I keep getting this wrong. I keep having to come back and re uh, refilming it. So that's fine. That's all checks out. And then the last thing we do, not port, is we just then select the image that we want to download and run. The D flag just means we're running it uh, in a detached mode, which means when the image downloads and runs, we get our command prompt returned back to us. That's all that means. So MCR Microsoft.com MSSQL Server and then the version is 2017, latest Ubuntu. Don't know if you can hear the sirens in the background there. There's a hospital quite nearby where I live, so you often hear ambulances sp speeding past. Um, so I think that looks correct. I'm just double checking the port allocation is correct. Yep, that looks okay. So hit enter. You can see there that it can't find uh, unable to find a copy of the image locally, that's okay. Um, and so it just pulls down an image from the, the relevant repository, which I think in this case is just Docker Hub, uh, uh, as, as you'd expect. Um, now, what you'll see here while that's downloading is we don't actually have, as, as I've said already, we don't have a SQL Server image. You will see that eventually pop up in here when it's downloaded. And then once it's downloaded and it runs, you'll then see the container running here. Uh, and then what we'll do is we'll connect into our instance of SQL Server using something like Management Studio just to make sure it's working. And then we'll test it against our API. Okay, so that has finally downloaded and it started to run. Um, you can see, as I was saying, the image has now appeared in our list of Im available local images. So if we ran that command again, you wouldn't have to wait a few minutes to download it. It would just, it would be there. Um, and then you can also see that we now have a running SQL Server container up here as well. So just to check that it's all working correctly, I'm going to fire up Management Studio. And uh, it's just started on my other screen. Let's just drag it across and I click on the connect icon. I've already had this sort of pre-filled, but um, we just use localhost, comma, 1433. We'll use SQL Server authentication. Change this to SA, and then we'll just type in our password. If I get that correct. Okay, cool. So it connects in. So no problems connecting into the container uh, from, from here. There are some system databases, which are just the internal one SQL Server uses to manage itself. There are no other databases there or anything else. It's completely, um, completely clean. Now, what you would usually do here is you would start to create user accounts specifically for your API and all that kind of stuff. I'm not going to do that. That is not best practice. We're just going to use the SA account. But again, um, in the interest of time, that's not the focus of this video. So what I want to do now is run our, uh, run our API. And what we should start to see is uh, when the startup class runs, this will run and you, we should start to see some messaging around uh, database migrations being run and data being seeded. And then we can go back in here and we should see that the database has been created with data in it. Um, and then we can also run the API itself to, to pull that data back. So this is kind of the moment of truth. Um, if I've made any coding mistakes at any point in time, this is where they'll get flushed out. So everything's saved. Let me just go back to my file view here. Everything's saved. So all we simply do is .NET run and wait with bated breath. So it's saying apply migrations, which is a good sign. 
Uh, looks like that looks okay. Um, adding data, seeding, okay. And then it's saying our hosting environment's development. And it's giving us our usual listening stuff. So that looked like that actually worked. I sound surprised, I shouldn't be, but um, it's very easy to make at least one small mistake and uh, you have to go back and find where that is, but that seems to have worked okay. So you can see here, I've just done a refresh on our management studio session and you can see that we have, indeed, we have a colors database now um, and with all the standard folders and we should have a color items table um, now. And we should also have data in there. So if we do select everything from uh, color items, we don't actually get our colors. Wonder why that is. Okay. I think we've probably left something out. So here's one of the coding mistakes that I was talking about. So let's go back to our prep DB. I think I know what I've done wrong. Yes, I know what I've done wrong. I've forgotten one very, very uh, important command. So this, this was actually probably quite a good mistake to make. Um, I've simply forgot to put in context, save, whoop, save changes. Okay, so we kind of said we're going to add all this data, but I didn't actually save it. So it didn't actually go into the database. So cool. So that's actually a, it's a good use case. So let's Let's stop our application. Let's rerun it. Again, it's checking to see if the migrations have been run. Uh, and it should have said seeding data in here. We go adding seed data. So let's go back now over here. Um, just do a refresh over here to make sure. Yep, so our database is still there. We've still got the same table. If we select from color items now, there we go. Our colors are now in the database. So that's all cool. And then the last thing to check before we really move on to Docker Compose, you'll be pleased to hear, is to, if I just bring over a, a web browser, if I do local host port 5000 API values, there you go. We're just checking that the actual API itself works. So again, we are actually hitting our Values controller, and we're calling this this action method here, and we're just getting our colors returned back. And there you go; you can see that's all working quite nicely. So, just to reiterate what we've done, we have uh, let me bring this back up. We have um, started a SQL Server instance in Docker, and we have run our API locally on our machine. It's still not in a container yet, um, so and that all worked. Well, so what I'm going to do next is repackage our API as a container and start that up. So basically rebuild this, this one here, restart it as a container and see what happens. Okay, so because we've made code changes to our Docker API, we're going to have to rebuild the Docker image. Remember we did that at the start of the video, we're going to have to rebuild it because again, there's been changes. And then when it starts up, we'll see what happens. Now it should again attempt to connect into the SQL Server instance, try and apply the migrations, try and see the data. And again, if, if the migrations have been run and there's already data there, we should see the appropriate messages saying, don't need to do that, but, by, but it should theoretically, or should it still connect into the SQL Server? But let's let's test that theory. So first thing we need to do is rebuild an image. So it's just Docker build. And again, make sure you're in the right working directory so it can find the Docker file. And we're just going to tag it. I need to spell it correctly though. I type. My typing used to be quite good, but it's definitely degraded. I don't know if my, because my fingers are cold. Okay, so docker build uh, hyphen t binary thistle forward slash color API. And then don't forget to put in the trailing period to say this is our current working directory. And that should go off and build or rebuild our, um, rebuild our uh, image. Um, Yep, so that was incredibly quick. We've already got the images that it needs. Um, it looks like it's done that okay. It was incredibly quick though, wasn't it? Okay, looks like it was okay. It doesn't look like there's any uh, issues there. Okay, 
fine. Um, and then we will just run it now. So we've got our rebuilt image. Let's just, um, actually, I'm gonna delete this container because I'm not sure that actually did do what I wanted it to do. And I'm gonna delete this image as well. I'm not convinced it actually did do a rebuild. So let's just issue that again. Okay, yeah, it was very, very quick. Fair enough, okay. Um, I'm just double checking. I wanna make sure that the changes have taken place. So then we just do a Docker run. And then it's, we map again in a similar way as we did with our SQL image, we map our port. So we're gonna map externally to port 8080. And we're gonna map to the internal port 80 that we're exposing here. And then we just basically give the name of the image that we want to run. So binary thistle forward slash color API. And we should see a running container in there. There we go, it's starting to run. And you can see here it's trying to apply the migrations. And we get a whole host of errors. And if we actually have a look at the errors, if we just scroll up and see what it's complaining about, it's saying basically a network related error meant that we couldn't find the SQL Server. The server was not found or was not accessible. So what's going on there? We didn't change anything. We, we still have our instance of SQL Server running. It's using the same credentials. We've not changed any of that. All we've done is packaged up our API as an image and run it. It worked okay when we ran it locally. We can still connect into the SQL Server from Management Studio, but as soon as we packaged up our API into a Docker image, we have problems. That is not an error, that is not a bug, that is by design. So if you go back to the central concepts of what Docker is, it's about containerizing applications, and part of that is keeping things separate. And so by default, the network path between two containers actually is kind of prohibited. So you actually need to ensure, uh, you have to actually explicitly, should I say, you have to explicitly set up those networking permissions. Now, this is where Docker Compose really comes into play. So just before we jump into the specifics of Docker Compose and, and networking within Docker Compose, there is another way of networking between containers that I just want to mention. I'm not gonna cover it here. Uh, and that is software defined networks. So you can use this concept if you, you're interested, I would Google that. The other one is using Docker Compose to allow networking between containers, which is what we've got to do here. Now, just quickly stepping back to um, what is Docker Compose, I think it's probably a good time to revisit that. Um, it reduces the reliance on and simplifies the use of the Docker command line. Now, you can see that we've set up our um, SQL Server instance using the command line. We've set up our um, API using the command line. Can you imagine if you had other components that you needed to spin up and you were just typing away at the command line and you can see the command line is quite long. It's very error prone. Um, and you can actually, if you're using things like volumes and other, other bits and pieces, it actually gets really, really, really long. So it's difficult enough and laborious enough when you've just got two containers that you need to run, but you may be running many, many more than that. So the command line is fine for hacking about and just spinning things up here and there in an ad hoc manner, but if you're actually wanting to run things um, as a whole harmonious end-to-end -end ecosystem, it's not really, not really suitable. So one of the main things about Docker Compose is you can kind of coordinate the spinning up of your containers and actually you can have set dependencies between them and all that kind of stuff as well. So you, you can start one before the other one starts, all that kind of thing. Um, yep, allows us to start up multiple containers quickly. And the last point here is allows us set, to set up connections between containers. So you'll be pleased to hear finally we come on to using Docker Compose and it all centers around a Docker Compose file that we basically set up services in and that which allows us to start containers quickly and network them together. So we're going to do that now. Okay, so we're going to build up our uh, Docker Compose file now and we just, we're going to add that to our project. Just a bit of housekeeping just to um, 
make you aware of what I've done here. I've, I've removed the two containers that uh, we had previously created at our command line, just to keep it a bit cleaner and more straightforward, so you can see what's going on when we come to use Docker Compose. The other thing I want to just uh, change briefly, because I've had some problems with it, is I'm going to change the default password that we're going to use for a SQL Server, and I'm not going to use dollar signs. The main reason for that is when we come to use the Docker Compose file, we need to specify that password in there. And I've had some issues with dollar signs. You can apparently escape the use of the dollar sign. I actually couldn't get it to work. It just caused me a lot of problems. So if you've got an answer to that, I'd be really interested to hear it below. If I find the answer to it, then I'll, I'll post it below as well. But just to keep it straightforward, we're going to just change the use of dollar signs in our default password for SQL Server, so make sure we save that. And again, just coming back to the fact we have no containers here, um, they're gone, they're blown away. So it, when we run this up, um, the migration should be applied again and all that kind of stuff. And the SQL Server instance will be started with, well, you'll see in a minute, with this password. Um, well, let's do it now. So back over into our project, we're gonna create the Docker Compose file at the root, and it's just called Docker compose.yml and you get a nice pink icon there um, and and we just begin by specifying the version um, which at this point in time is 3 move that out of the way for you and this is a, a, a YAML file so it works a lot off white space so you've got to be quite careful with how you indent things Visual Studio Code's pretty good. It usually does a good job for you, but just um, be aware of it. Now, as I said, it, uh, Docker Compose works around this concept of services. I, I mean, it's probably easiest to think of a service almost like a running container or how you want to take an image and run it as a container. So it really is a combination of both, I guess, the image that you want to use along with some config. So it's almost exactly like um, what you're running at the command line, but just scripted in a YAML file. So we're going to create two services. Um, and you can see the Visual Studio code is indented nicely for us. And we're going to call, you can call this anything you like, but I'm just going to call it MS SQL server. That can be anything. It's really just a tag or a name. And then we want to specify the image. Uh, so there should be fairly familiar to you, mcrmicrosoft.com forward slash mssql forward slash server and then the version 2017 latest so it's exactly what we typed in at the command line, exactly the same image that we're using and then we're going to pass in some environment variables I'm sure I spell it correctly um, and again, familiar, it's just the same environment variables that we passed in our command line. So you can start to see by, by using Docker Compose, it, and you'll see when we actually come to running it, um, you don't have to type in these lengthy command line arguments again. So that's uh, bonus number one. Uh, except e, uh, EULA equals, oh, it's not equals, so you use the colon and then uh, the value in quotes. SA password. And again, this is what I'm talking about. I had issues with using dollar signs in the, in this YAML file. So we're just going to go back over here and we're going to use this one instead. And then the last one is the flavor of uh, SQL server we want to use, MSSQL PID. Not piss. <laughs> um, let's express. And then we want to set up the ports. And so we use 1433 map to 1433. So again, very, very similar to the command line stuff that we used. We then want to set up a second server. So this, this whole uh, block here, that's the service configuration for our SQL Server. It's effectively exactly what we had previously typed at the command line. So we're going to set up one now for our color API. Again, you can call it anything you like. And this time, 
we're not going to specify an image exactly specifically we're just going to say we want to build whatever is in the docker file so the docker file specifies how we want to build our api it's just going to basically use that and hook into that so it's quite simple and then like with a command line all we really then need to do is specify the ports that we want I'm just realizing i haven't put a colon in there uh, and the ports that we want are um, 8080 external mapped to our port 80 internally. That's it. So this is kind of almost scripted up the starting up of our services or, or containers. You may ask, well, you've not really explicitly done any networking stuff other than the port allocation, which we had already done at the command line. So how is this going to make any difference to the problem that we had with our two containers? Well, this is one of the beauty, no, the, one of the nice, be beautiful things about Docker Compose. Simply by the fact that you've defined your services within a Docker Compose file basically puts them onto the same network. Now, there are more complicated networking configurations that you can do within Docker Compose. I'm not going to cover them here today. I'm just going to do the kind of basics that you, you need to get things up and running. So, uh, just checking over that, that all looks kind of okay, I've saved that. Now the way that you run a docker compose file is docker-compose up. And before I run that, I'm just going to move back over to our um, docker plugin so you can see what's happening there. So, let's run that, it will go away and it will spin up our images and you'll see up here um, a number of things happening. So. We can see now that we've got a Microsoft SQL Server image running and a Color API instance running. Now, something's gone wrong because you can see that the Color API container has stopped. Why has it stopped? Well, I actually know why it stopped. Um, I knew it would fail. And the, the reason, and this is still doing stuff, but I'll just explain why it's failing. Over here in our startup, it's using the default server string of local host. Now, basically it cannot resolve that. It can't really use this local host string to connect to our SQL server. It doesn't know what that is. So a very quick fix for that is to use the name of the service of your SQL server. So if we copy that and we paste that in here instead, as our default server name, that should work. So if we save that and we'll just control C in here, that will just close down our running, uh, running containers. I'm going to get rid of these. You don't have to do this. I just like to do it for peace of mind to make sure it's rebuilding uh, everything that I need it to rebuild. And I'll also delete the image that it created. So let's just remove that as well. Cool. So again, we've not changed our Docker Compose file, that's remained exactly the same. All we have changed is the name of the server, and that's going to use the name of the service in Docker Compose. And because it's running in Docker Compose, it's Docker Compose knows to basically translate that tag name into a, um, an IP address, I would presume, that allows us to connect to the SQL Server. So let's try that one more time. Okay, so that all looks like it's uh, worked correctly. So you can see here it's adding data um, because clearly the image didn't exist, or sorry, the container didn't exist prior to that. So if we move back over to a, uh, let's get an instance of Firefox up and running. And we'll go over to our local host. And we use 8080. Uh, let's remember that from last time. There you go. It's actually pulled back the colors from our database. And if you go back over to here, I was just, uh, just connected into my. Uh, I'll just disconnect from that. I'll just kill that. Uh, and we'll kill that. And we'll reconnect in. So we want to go to localhost 1433.
and you can see that we've connected into that container and yeah it's created everything as expected now again just to reiterate we've actually connected into that container from an external application that was not it's not running in a container if that makes sense so we could just connect straight into it however coming back to the point if things are running in containers then they're automatically barred from talking to each other hence the need for docker compose okay so one of the things that i just want to finish off on is we actually hard coded the name of the sql server service in our code which is not what you want to do and the whole reason for using environment variables is so that we can inject these values in more dy in a more dynamic way so let's um let's revert this back to something that's not going to work so again if we don't have a db server environment variable we're going to use localhost and as you know that will not work so what we can then do is go over to our docker compose file and add in in the same way that we did with our sql server an environment section and pass in any of these environment variables that we want to. So we're going to pass in a DB server. So let's just uh, copy that. Make sure you give it the same name and then whatever you want the DB server name to be. I'm just going to copy this. We'll save that. And we'll delete these containers and then we'll rerun our docker compose file and it should work. And indeed it does. So both containers are still running and we can probably go back to here and just rerun that and yep, yeah, it's all cool. Okay, well that brings us to the end of this video on docker compose. It was quite a lot of setup to get us where we needed to be um, and there's clearly a lot more things that we could do with Docker Compose. I really just scraped the surface with it but we did enough I feel to get everything up and running that we needed to and to provide you with a nice foundation on which to move forward. So other than that thanks again for joining me. Um, if you liked the video please give it a like and if you haven't done so already please subscribe but I won't hold that against you if you decide not to. So until I make uh, my next video, I'll see you again very soon.